This talk will be about the Riemann Rock theorem in the case of genus two surfaces. So when G is equal to two, the Riemann Rock theorem states that the dimension of the space of functions with poles only on D is the degree of D plus one minus G plus L of K minus D. And of course, since G is two, we can replace this term by minus one. And we also know as usual that the degree of K is two G minus two, which is two and L of K is G, which is equal to two. And now what we want to do is to try and work out what L of D is in terms of degree of D. So first of all, suppose the degree of D is less than zero, then we know that L of D is equal to zero as always. If the degree of D is equal to zero, then as we've seen before, the dimension of L of D is either naught or one, and it's one in the case when D is equivalent to zero and zero otherwise. And if the degree of D is greater than two, then L of D is equal to the degree of D minus one, because the degree of K minus D is now negative, so L of K minus D is zero. If the degree of D is equal to two, then L of D is equal to zero or is equal to one or two, and it's equal to two if um, D is equivalent to the canonical device, as you can check easily, and one otherwise. This is essentially dual to the result when the degree of D is zero. If the degree of D is one, then elementary arguments show that L of D is zero, one, or two, but it can't be equal to two because if it were two, we would have a two-dimensional space of functions with a, and this would give us a rational map to the um, projective line, um, which was generically one-to-one, -one, which is not possible because that would mean the surface had genus zero. So, so the degree has to be zero or one. Um, and this means that we can draw a sort of graph of um, what L of D looks like as follows. So suppose we just draw minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, three. So this is the degree of D. And up here we have um, the dimension of the functions with poles only on D. And the graph sort of looks like this, um, except we've got these ambiguities because um, for when degree of D is zero, this could be zero or one. Um, here it could be zero or one, and here it could be one or two. So really the graph sort of looks like one of these things here. And just for comparison, um, you remember when uh, the genus is zero, the graph looks like this. And when the genus is one, the graph looks like this, except that there's, there, you remember there was a bit of an ambiguity here because it could go like that instead. Um, so the canonical divisor is here for genus two and here for genus one and here for genus zero. And um, um, these points are the ones where the divisor is equivalent to zero and these points are the ones where the divisor is equivalent to a point. Um, so you see, as the genus goes up, we get more and more ambiguities about how the dimension of L of D varies. Um, next, 
uh, we can look at some examples of genus two surfaces. So we can take the following examples. We can take the curve y squared equals x minus alpha one, x minus alpha two, x minus alpha three, x minus alpha four, equal x minus alpha five. Or we can take the curve y squared equals x minus alpha one, and can't be bothered to write it out, up to x minus alpha six. And both of these, um, if they're compactified, will give us examples of genus two surfaces. You can see they're all two to one maps um, from the curve to the projected plane, if we don't worry too much about the point at infinity. So this is just taking a point x, y to x. And it's two to one, except at these set when x is one of these six points, um, possibly including infinity, where there are two possible values of y. So we can draw a picture of the surface as follows. We take two copies of the projective line, and I'm going to draw the projective line in a slightly funny way like this, because what I've done is I've taken the points alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, alpha 4, alpha 5, and the point either alpha 6 or infinity, depending on which of these you're doing. And I've cut the projective line um, along here. So, so there's a sort of, I've, I've made a cut from alpha 1 to alpha 2 and from alpha 3 to alpha 4 and so on. So now there's a sort of circular bit. And I'm going to do the same thing with the other copy of the projective line. And we get something like this. And now we should glue these together like that. So we get a sort of surface which looks a bit like this. Um, you see it's really a genus two surface, um, which is a sort of sphere with two handles on. Um, so this shows that these curves do indeed have topological genus equal to two. Um, we can also look at one forms on these surfaces. And for hyperelliptic um, surfaces such as these, we can easily write down one form. So we have y squared equals x minus alpha one, up to say x minus alpha six. Hyperelliptic um, just refers to curves of the form y squared equals polynomial in x. In the, in the case when it's a polynomial of degree three or four, you get an elliptic curve. And we've got some obvious differentials, which are dx over y and x dx over y. And these are actually um, holomorphic. Um, well, we need to check they're holomorphic at the points where y is equal to zero and also at the point infinity. And at y equals zero, we just use the fact that two y dy is equal to this rather monstrous expression. We take x minus alpha one up to x minus alpha five plus x minus alpha one to x minus alpha four times x minus alpha six plus various other expressions times dx. And the only thing you really need to know about this mess is that it's not equal to zero at x equals alpha one up to alpha six, as you can easily check. And then we see that dx over y is equal to 2y dy over y times this mess, um, which is equal to dy over something that's um, non-zero. And this is regular at x equals alpha i. So it doesn't have a pole at y equals naught. We should also check what happens at x equals infinity, so let's put z equals 1 over x, and when x tends to infinity, the term um, y over x cubed tends to a finite value, so let's put w equals y over x cubed, and this equation then becomes w squared equals 1 minus alpha 1z up to 1 minus alpha 6z. And we find that x to the n dx over y is equal to minus c to the one minus n dz over w. Well, w is quite harmless because it's finite non-zero at z equals naught. But we see from this that we must have n 
less than or equal to one in order for this thing to be holomorphic. Um, this is why things like x cubed d x squared dx over y are no good because they have a pole at, in, at the point at infinity. So we just get a two-dimensional space of one forms on this hyperelliptic surface. Um, in general, if you have, um, if, if I went up to x to the eight, then we could have an x cubed here, but not an x, sorry, an x squared here, but not an x cubed and so on. Um, next, um, we can look at the possible zeros of a one form. So if we've got a, so if we've got this hyperelliptic curve, y squared equals x minus alpha for one up to x minus alpha six, um, you can sort of think of it as something like this. So here's alpha one, alpha two, and so on. We've got six points and the curve is going to look something like this maybe. And the points generally come in pairs with the same x coordinates. So we've got various pairs of points. And if we look at a, a typical one form, which would be something like a plus bx over y dx, this will have two zeros at um, x plus or minus y. We'll have zeros at, at a pair of points, or it might have a double zero at some point alpha i zero. So there are so the zeros of a one so a one form always have, has two zeros, and these are usually at distinct points. But there are six special points where it has a double zero. So these are actually um, there are six points on this curve where a one form has a double zero. And this means that these six points are not equivalent to any of the other points on the hyperelliptic curve under an automorphism. So this is quite unlike the case of genus zero or genus one curves. For instance, on a genus one curve, the group of automorphisms is transitive, so there aren't any special points. Whereas as soon as you get to genus two and above, you find lots and lots of rather special points. Um, so these points can are sometimes called theta characteristics. So, so a theta characteristic is roughly a divisor d such that 2d is um, um, equivalent to the canonical divisor. In other words, it's a set of zeros of a one form. So you see, if you take each of these points, there's a one form with a double zero at that point. So, so, so two times this point is equivalent to the canonical divisor. So these, these are some examples of um, um, theta characteristics. Um, from this, we can also work out the automorphism group of an elliptic curve, oh, sorry, hyperelliptic curve. First of all, it's got a group Z modulo 2Z taking Y to minus Y. You remember Y squared is equal to X minus alpha one to x minus alpha six. Um, um, secondly, you may be able to permute the values alpha one up to alpha six. And these are all elements of P1. And these can be permuted using the group PGL2 of C, which is the automorphism group of P1. And what's the size of the subgroup of PGL2C permuting these points? Well, it depends what points you choose. Usually, th there won't be any permutations of these in PGL2C. So the automorphism group of the hyperelliptic curve will have order two. But there are some cases when it can be much bigger. For, for example, if we take the numbers alpha i to be 0, 1, i minus i minus one and infinity. You can think of these as being the vertices of an octahedron in the Riemann sphere. Then it's got various permutations. For instance, you can take x to i times x or x to x plus one over minus x plus one. 
And these will generate a group of permutations of these of order 24. In fact, it's the, the group of rotations of an octahedron. So um, the automorphism group of the corresponding hy hyperelliptic curve, y squared equals x to the 5 minus x. Um, if you compactify it at a point at infinity, then its automorphism group will be z over 2z times um, the group of rotations of an octahedron, which is um, the symmetric group S4. In fact, this is the maximal possible order of a hyperelliptic curve. Um, of course, this affine curve has a smaller automorphism group than that because the, the point at infinity would be fixed. Uh, the automorphism group is only this big if you, if you compactify this by adding a point at infinity. Um, now we can try and identify, we want to show that all genus two curves are in fact hyperelliptic. And to do this, we can study the size of NP for P being a point. Um, so how can this behave? Well, um, suppose we have N down here. It can be minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. What are the possibilities? Well, obviously, it has to be 0 if N is less than 0. And for n equals zero, it's obviously one because we've got the constants. And here it must be one because the curve is not a genus zero. And then we've got an ambiguity here. And then carries on like that. So there are, there, 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 there are two possible ways this function can behave. And you can see that this happens when 2p is equivalent to the canonical divisor. And this thing happens otherwise. So, so there are six points where this happens and all the other points, this happens. These points, by the way, are called Weierstrass points. So a Weierstrass point is a point P where L of P is bigger than usual. So you find that 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 that, that Generically, the most points have L of NP being something fairly small, and occasionally you get points where it's a bit bigger than usual. So for genus zero or one curves, there are no Weierstrass points because L of NP is entirely determined by N. But in genus two and above, we start getting all these rather special points. Um, anyway, in, in general, from the by um, looking but using the fact the canonical divisor has, has two dimensions, this gives us a map um, from the curve to P1 by taking two elements of this as coordinates on P1. And we're going to pick P to be a ramification point of C for this map. So this means that um, L of 2C is now equal to 2. So in other words, we're picking P to be one of the bias Strice points. And um, let's work out what L of NP looks like and work out what the corresponding functions are. So let's take N to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And what's L of NP? Well, it goes 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And you should notice that here, there's a sort of, here and here, there are sort of glitches where the number doesn't go up by 1 as it usually does. So let's try and write down the basis for the functions for all these spaces. Well, for n equals zero, it's obvious what we get. We just get constant functions. For n equals one, we get nothing new because one is equal to that number there. For n equals two, we get a new function, x with a double pole at p. So we don't know what x is yet. Let's just call it x. And for n equals three, we see we get no extra functions. For n equals four, we get one extra function with a pole of order four. Well, that's not really new because it's just x squared. 
Then for n equals five, we get a new function. We can't get that from any polynomial in x. So it's a new function, let's call it y, which has an order five pole at p. And then when n is six, we want an order six pole, well, we can get that from x cubed. When n equals seven, we get an order seven pole, well, that's x, y. Then we get an order eight pole, that's x to the four. Then we get an order nine pole, well, that's obviously x squared, y. Then we get an order 10 pole, well, that could be y squared or x to the five. And at this point we stop because if you count up, we now have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 functions in a nine dimensional vector space. So we get a linear relation between them forced by the riemann roch theorem, which says that something times y squared plus something times x squared y plus something times x y plus something times y equals something times x to the five plus something x to the four plus something x cubed plus something x squared plus something x plus something. Well, we can of course simplify this a bit. So um, we can um, change y to y plus something times x squared times y if we're not in characteristic two and get rid of this term here. Similarly, we can get rid of this term by adding a multiple of x to y and we can get rid of this term and we can get rid of this constant term here by rescaling x, assuming that uh, our field is algebraically closed and so on. So in an algebraically closed field of characteristic zero, we can reduce to um, the case of the curve y squared equals x minus alpha one up to x minus alpha five. So over the complex numbers, every genus two curve is of this form. Um, by the way, a bit, bit, a, bit, a bit of a warning here. This is not a non-singular curve in um, two-dimensional projective space. Um, so you remember for elliptic curves, we had y squared was a cubic polynomial in x, and that was regular at infinity. Um, if we choose projective coordinates, in, for this case, we get y squared z cubed equals x minus alpha one z up to x minus alpha five z. And if we look at the point zero, one, zero, which is x, y, z, this is a point on the curve and we can look at it locally by setting y equals one. And we find we've got the curve z cubed equals x minus alpha one z up to x minus alpha five z. And now you see this is singular at x equals z equals zero. So this curve here, if we, if we try and embed it as a plane curve, it picks up a singularity at infinity. For elliptic curves, this didn't matter because we had a z to the one here, so it was regular at infinity. Um, so how can we embed a hyperelliptic curve as a non-singular plane curve? The answer is you can't, um, because a non-singular plane curve in P2 of degree D as genus G minus one, G minus two over two, uh, sorry, D minus one times D minus two over two, which is one of the numbers zero, one, three, six, ten, and so on. So um, a curve of genus two cannot be embedded as a non-singular plane curve in the projective in the projective plane. Um, well, if we can't embed our hyperelliptic curve as a non-singular plane curve, how can we represent it? Well, let's just list a few. So these are ways to represent the genus two curve over the complex numbers. So first of all, we can just represent it as a double cover of the projective line branched at six points, which would be y squared equals x minus alpha one 
from x minus alpha six, which is the one we've been studying. Now, for elliptic curves, we saw we could represent them as the complex numbers modulo a lattice. So this is g equals one. And for g equals naught curves, we could just represent it as the Riemann sphere. Um, and there's an analog for genus two curves. We can represent it as the upper half plane modulo a discrete group. Um, so what is going on is for any Riemann surface, we can represent it as a simply connected covering space modulo a discrete group. And the, the possible simply connected Riemann surfaces are the Riemann sphere, which gives you genus naught surfaces, the complex plane, which gives you genus one surfaces, and the upper half plane, which gives you absolutely everything else. Um, so in this case, we would work with elliptic functions, which are functions on the complex plane invariant under the lattice L. The analog in this case are called automorphic functions, or um, modular functions sometimes. Um, this group here is called a Fuchsian group. Fuchsian group is just a discrete subgroup of PSL2R, which is the group of automorphisms of the upper half plane. Um, and everything you can do with elliptic functions has an analog, only it's even more interesting and more complicated for automorphic functions and Fuchsian groups. Um, and I'm not going to discuss that because it's more appropriate for an entire lecture course rather than for a few minutes at the end of a lecture. Um, so that gives a second way of representing genus two curves. A third way, you can represent them as plane curves in P2 with one double point. So a double point will look something like that. Um, if you want to represent them as curves without singularities, you can represent them like that in P3, um, where you can take the intersection of a suitable quadric intersected with a cubic. And if, these, if their intersection of these contains a line, um, then the rest of it will usually be a genus two curve. So um, you can embed, although you can't embed them as non-singular curves in the plane, you can embed them um, like that in three-dimensional projective space. Finally, we can do an analog of what we did with the elliptic curves. Um, we take a map Z and we integrate the differentials. So for elliptic curves, we integrated from a fixed point A to Z of dx over y. Well, for a genus two curve, we've got two independent differentials. So we should also integrate x dx over y. And this will sort of be an element of c squared, except it's not really defined because there are many different paths from a to z. So there's an ambiguity. Now for elliptic curves, the ambiguity was a lattice generated by two elements. Here the ambiguity is a lattice generated by by four elements because the first homology of a genus two surface is, is z to the four. So this is isomorphic to z to the four. Um, this space here turns out to be a um, projective variety called the Jacobian of our elliptic curve C. Um, so what we have here is a map from um, our curve C to the Jacobian, which is C squared modulo a lattice and is therefore topologically a torus S1 to the four. So the, uh, we did an analog of this for elliptic curves and it happened to be an isomorphism. So the elliptic curve is actually isomorphic to its Jacobian. For genus greater than one, the Jacobian is bigger than the curve we start with. And instead of getting an isomorphism, we just get an embedding of the curve into its Jacobian. So that gives um, five ways of representing the genus two curve. Okay, I think that's enough about genus two curves at the moment. The next lecture will presumably be about genus three curves.